Good morning, everybody. Today's a real good day to talk about how rivers flow. <laughs> Just think about what's happening now. What comes out of the sky, how it gets to the channel, what it means, how long it takes to reach the Gulf of Mexico, all that good stuff. We'll touch on that today. A couple quick things. Some mentioned about uh, seeing the APT uh, show. And uh, it, was, it was brought to my attention. Someone asked about the river that was shown there. And I, I realized that the uh, Josh, Josh uh, Woods is the communications director in the College of Ag. And he kind of set it all up. But um, he needed footage. And so a lot of that, this is a secret. Um, a lot of that is from Veracruz, Mexico, where I work with a Global Water Watch project. We brought Josh a uh, year ago, October, to uh, the Rio Pisquiac. It's in the cloud forest of Veracruz State on the Gulf of Mexico. And so a lot of those really pretty stream shots, if you really know Alabama streams, you'd say, wait a minute, you know, we don't have tree ferns in Alabama. <laughs> because he, we were up in the uh, you know, higher, maybe five, 6,000 feet in, uh, in Veracruz. Veracruz is a very interesting state. It's, it's a California shape, hugs the Gulf, about half of, uh, of uh, Mexico's Gulf Coast and about a quarter of the entire Gulf Coast. Because as we say, we don't call it the Gulf of Alabama or the Gulf of Louisiana. You know, Mexico has more than half of the Gulf Coast. And, um, but if you could picture Mount Chiha being five times higher than it is. It's only 2,200, 2,300 feet. You know, get it up there over 10,000 feet, and then in the same distance, hit the Gulf of Mexico. And that's what the Pico Orizaba in Veracruz is. It's a snow-capped, extinct volcano uh, running at about 12,000 feet, about the same distance from the Gulf as Mount Chiha is to Gulf Shores. So you're talking about very high gradient streams, cold streams, trout streams. There's trout farms all along the escarpment, just like there is in Carolina, you know, North Carolina coming off the, the higher um, Appalachians. And it's just a gorgeous place to go. Been there several times. But it showed up in the film and I had to laugh, as did some of our Mexican water monitors. But anyways, I think it's going to show again. I don't think they'd do that for one showing, but I, if you missed it, I think it's might even be tonight. Somebody told me it was tonight, too, but you can check listings. I don't get it. I have DISH, and I get um, Georgia public television, so I haven't seen that part yet. So anyways, um, oh, one other thing uh, Maureen mentioned coming in. She did a little poking around, and William Wyatt Bibb was a medical doctor. He practiced for a while before he became governor. So maybe some of you have other little factoids. Anybody poke around on the seal and have anything to share? Uh, always feel free to do so. And also, while I'm at it, let me point out, if any of you are from either the Tennessee Valley, you know, from Sand Mountain, Gunnersville, Huntsville, Decatur, Florence, Tuscumbia, uh, let me know at break if you feel like having a river story next week. Next week, we're going to jump into the, not literally, figuratively, jump into the rivers themselves, start looking at basin by basin. Uh, and we're going to do the Tennessee and the coastal plains. So if you're, if you're anywhere like Union Springs, Andalusia, Op, Elba, um, over to, almost over to Fairhope, down at Dothan, anywhere in there, if that's where you come from, got a river story, got a memory, fishing, swimming, almost drowning, whatever, you know. It's fun to kind of bring that out of the group. So some of you have approached me um, about where you're from, and I know we got some Tom Bigby people here. We got some uh, locals, Alabama Coosa, Tallapoosa, but it'd be great to um, share our stories, even very brief, less than a minute, just a memory, funny story, whatever. So um, we'll pick up where we left off, quick review of last week, how rivers form, and that whole um, segment on people and rivers, a little bit of, of the human history. 
And then uh, the new stuff will look a little more at our hydrology, how rivers flow, and, and get into its biota. So um, I gave you the three views of Alabama, the so-called stage through which these rivers flow, both on the surface and subsurface. And just as a quick reminder, we have a very diverse geology. If you peel back the, uh, the noise, so-called, all the detail, uh, there are three major uh, depositions of rock that um, correspond to the geological slice of time from the Paleozoic up here. There's rock 500 million years old. Down here, there's rock, you know, a couple million years old. And we kind of walk through time as we go from the northeast to the southwest. So the older so-called hard or crystalline rock, much of it is uh, especially over this way, crystalline, um, older rock of the Paleozoic era uh, on up to about um, 200 million years ago. And then uh, the middle life, the Mesozoic, this is the black belt, the chalky marine deposits, and then the more recent Cenozoic stuff. When we get to the Alabama, I was down here fossil hunting once, and uh, I got it in my living room now. I found a whale vertebra, about a 40 million year old whale vertebra when they had legs, when they had little hind legs, like the one in, in the Museum of Natural History in Tuscaloosa. So this, this is the more recent stuff, um, less than 60 million years old. You gotta think, you know, when we say recent, we're talking like a geologist, you know, only 60 million. Uh, and then, finally, the, the five physiographic provinces, four in this older rock, hard rock area. Uh, and we explained a little bit about how we got the metamorphic rock here, the folded rock here, and more or less the flat rock here. And then this giant coastal plain, our largest province. And we left off with uh, taming the rivers. Okay, so we, we went all the way back to Paleo-Indian, uh, times where Alabama was one of the first areas in the whole East North America that was colonized by Native Americans for obvious reasons. It wasn't under ice. It, it was productive. It had a rich um, food source, both on land and water. Uh, and we walked through, you know, from the European uh, explorations conquests of you know, the Spanish, the French, the British, and then uh, work through some of the early American history, particularly with regard to the fall line and how that was such a key part of our settlement pattern because it was a physical barrier to navigation, but it was also a source of hydropower. So a lot of trade and our, many of our modern cities are on the fall line, Auburn included, uh, for that reason. So we're kind of, now we're jumping up into the early 20th century. Uh, this fellow here, very distinguished looking, William Patrick Lay. He, he was a Coosa River man, three generations. Uh, it, we'll get to him a little bit more when we get on the Coosa. But um, in a nutshell, his father came out of Virginia in the early 1800s and he was a flatboat operator, a businessman who moved goods, especially cotton on flatboat. His son, uh, this man's uh, father, uh, was a steamboat uh, operator. And so he, he knew rivers, he knew the Coosa. And in fact, his father was renowned because in the Civil War, he was able to move his steamboat uh, away from Union troops and uh, get through the shoals. There were some at their fall line on the Coosta, there are some long and very treacherous shoals that only the most experienced steamboat operators could get a big boat through. And he did, and he kept the boat from being captured and all that. So he was kind of a local hero. Um, so anyways, uh, William Patrick was a captain. Um, he, uh, among other things, saw the potential of these rivers before they were impounded. They needed to be tamed. As he is famously quoted, it's time to put these loafing streams to work. And he saw hydropower on a grand scale. 
And in fact, he founded the Alabama Power Company. So he's the one who started the whole deal. And in 1906, when he got it rolling, only 10% of Alabamians had any electricity in their homes. So it was kind of an elite privilege to have electrical power. And of course, he totally transformed that. And we'll get into a little bit about him. But then in the teens, I believe this picture is about 1917, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers started to tame the Tennessee River. This is the construction of Wilson Dam. And we have the Great Lakes of the South. We'll talk about next week the big um, continuous reservoirs that go across the entire Tennessee River in Alabama. And those uh, dams were built for navigation, flood control, later retrofitted, like 20 years later, by TVA for hydropower. But in these days, it was simply a uh, navigational lock and dam uh, system. And then uh, we get up into the 20s, um, largely through William Patrick Lay's company now, uh, Lake Martin. Uh, created the largest reservoir in the world in those days. So 1926, they closed that off. And um, many of you enjoy Lake Martin today. And then finally, we, we couldn't stop. You know, it, it, yesterday, we spent so much time engineering boats. You know, we went from canoes to flat boats, to steamboats, to barges. And we powered them in various ways from pikes and gondola type poles to, to, to coal and wood and, and, and diesel. And finally, somebody said, why are we engineering the boats? Let's just engineer the rivers, you know? So they started to really um, bring them in line, so to speak. And that had profound effects on, on the biota. We'll talk about that later in the morning. But, but this project um, is on the Tom Bigby. This is the 10 Tom waterway where they actually punched across a major divide and connected the Tennessee to the Mobile Basin uh, in the name of navigation down the Mississippi and having alternative routes to the Gulf and all the prosperity that would bring and so on and so forth to be continued when we get to the Tom Bigby. So just to wrap it up then, uh, we are conservatively know that Native Americans were here for 10,000 years and, and still are. But uh, they had, you know, 95% of all human occupation in Alabama. Uh, Europeans, I just say, from about the time DeSoto got in here, the Spanish in 1550, on up to the Revolution, and we know all the, the settlements of the French and British and Spanish with regard to rivers that we talked about. Early American, that boat era, on up to about statehood, uh, but about 1819, it was, it was right about the time things really started cooking. The, the federal road got punched through. Uh, population exploded. Cotton agriculture exploded. And the steamboat um, came in. I think the first steamboat came in out of Boston and uh, sailed into Mobile Bay. So the steamboat era, you know, kind of that renowned, kind of that iconic picture of the ladies with the big frilly bonnets and the big dresses. Um, saw a very interesting article this week about, about that. I'd be happy to send it to you. I sent it to Charlie Mitchell, who taught that cotton class. But it was talking about a painting. Maybe some of you saw this. It just came out. A, a textile historian wrote this book about the dress that changed the world. And it was Marie Antoinette who posed for a painting. And she was wearing cotton. And the French were just scandalized. They, they thought it was pornography. They thought it was so debased, you know. She's royalty. She must wear silk. You know, cotton is British. You know, they've got India, and they're growing cotton like there's no tomorrow. But a lot of women, especially in North America, they said, what a pretty dress. That is a great, who wants to wear silk? It's so expensive, and it's sticky in Alabama. We want cotton. And boom, it, it, it had profound found influence on cotton markets and slavery and, 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 and. And you just think, wow, one painting, one dress. And I know that isn't, you know, 100% of the story, but it's something I hadn't heard of. And it was a convincing argument, you know, 
Uh, but we thought Jackie Kennedy was influential when she changed her hair, you know, and everybody, I need that haircut. But, but here's a dress that actually affected tens of millions of people and global economies. Really, really neat um, article just came out. So then we come into that taming time. Um, well, taming in the low tech sense of the mills and the forges that we talked about, the low head dams, you know, under 20 feet, little, little like Moore's Mill, Wright's Mill, Beans Mill around here. Um, and, and then finally on up to the era of Alabama Power, the TVA and the Army Corps, which really went up into the 70s. We were still building the Ten Tom Waterway and even Lake Harris on the Tallapoosa above Lake Martin. They're all fairly recent. They're in the 60s, 1960s, in the Lewis Smith Lake on the Warrior. So we were building dams well into our time. And now, of course, modern river traffic and barges, but not as much as was envisioned. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we get to the basins. And now when you think of rivers, you know, you, some of you, have your nice little uh, lakefront, riverfront homes. Um, but billions of dollars in Alabama economy now more in ecotourism, uh, recreation, waterfront homes. I heard from uh, the former mayor of Alex City, who's now on a development, economic development commission. I think this was like five years ago, the average start on Lake Martin is $700,000. And Scrooge's home is like seven million. He's got like five swimming pools in addition to the lake right outside his door. But um, the, the gold mine, what, what Ben Russell said, living, having Lake Martin next to Alex City is like living next to a Fortune 500 company. These reservoirs have become economic engines for our state. Um, we've, we've redone the rivers. Uh, it had great expense, but it has tremendous benefits, economic and otherwise. And so that's kind of a real nutshell people and rivers, you know, the 10,000 year history in five minutes. Um, but it does, you know, go back to that state seal and how, um, as I wrote about in the, in the many meanings of the state seal, you can imagine if you went to that uh, early flat boat operator and you said, uh, what does the state seal mean to you? Or to the mill operator, the forge operator, you know, William Patrick Lay, what does the seal mean to you? What does the seal mean to you? What does the seal mean to, to Harold, who just uh, canoed the whole Tallapoosa, you know? It means different things. It, it's a morphing, changing symbol, uh, deep in meaning and identity. But our identity as Alabamians, I think, is quite tied to these rivers. And then just a, a, a brief commentary. I, I thought about this. this this week and threw this in, you know. We had 1550 DeSoto's soldiers bringing in their vicious dogs and, and, and torching villages and, and then we come up, you know, a little bit later, Andrew Jackson's troops and the Creek Glass Stand at Horseshoe Bend. When the Creek Nation fell, the Treaty of Fort Jackson, 1814, and the massive removal of Native Americans from Alabama you know, west of the Mississippi into um, Oklahoma, where many uh, trace their lineage today. And, you know, you think, well, gee, does anything really change? You know, here we are. I heard on national news today about the Rohingya and genocide and people moving in and bumping other people out. And it's just like, does it ever end, you know? And shortly after class, some of you probably saw this in the OA news, I always go to the comic page and then I do the Sudoku, I have a daily ritual. But they have the daily quote, you know, in the OA News, any of you read that? Um, it's a pretty profound quote, usually it's, it's quite good. And this is the one right after class. So I thought, this has got to be a slide. Will and Ariel Durand, famous uh, American historians, history repeats itself in the large because human nature changes with geological leisureliness. So I thought, what a great combo of doing river geology and people in rivers, you know, is like the perfect, the perfect quote, which doesn't say too much about us humans, but, but um, it is slow, you know, slow changing in terms of, in the terms of the way people treat people. But um, on to hydrology. Um, you saw this the first week. 
Uh, we wanted to make sure no one left the room without understanding a watershed, which we define as the land area that drains to a common point. So you can actually demarcate a line defined by topography where the rain of today will flow that way or that way. And inside the circle is the watershed of this point. And you can define that point as what is the watershed of this dam, like Lake Martin, and you, you define the line, the land area that drains to this point. So watersheds can be arbitrary, watersheds can be natural, uh, and water moves through the landscape in a variety of, of ways. This gives a little more detail on a very simplified watershed. Uh, again, seeing the drainage divide here, the high ground, the ridge, where water would run off down these slopes and enter the bank on the surface. Others, uh, water is going into the soil and coming out into the channel subsurface. And, and you know, we said only 2% of Americans could adequately define a watershed. I came across this. To me, this is the biblical definition of a watershed. Uh, the waters went up into the hills and down to the valleys to the places you had appointed. I think an appointed place for where water flows, pretty good definition of a watershed. You set the limits and springs into the valleys, they flow between the mountains. Then we get into more of the biota that we'll talk about later, the intimate link with terrestrial and aquatic organisms to streamside zones and the water itself, uh, very biologically productive. It's an ecotone where two major ecological systems are meeting and it's all there in just a few verses. So get out your Bible, dust it off, and read that verse. Um, so uh, the basins that we'll start to work on uh, next week, we showed this picture. About 10, about 10 basins here. Um, just as a heads up again next week, I'm going to do the Tennessee and the coastal plain, including this section over here west of Mobile Bay. Why would I pick this and this? Well, it's an odd combo, this and this. What's unique about those two basins? In Alabama, they are the only two that don't go here. They, they are the two areas that are outside of the greater Mobile Bay. So everything else in Alabama, you know, is no matter where you wash your car or spit, it's going to end up right there. But these not. These have their own outlets into these bays, and this one is heading to New Orleans. It's part of the Mississippi. So that's why next week we'll do the outside the Mobile Basin, and then we'll take the next three weeks to, to pick these apart and do within the Mobile Basin. And remember the nested bowl idea. There, we'll talk about this in a little more detail today um, when we look at stream order and hydrologic units and so on and so forth. But we gave the simple analogy of nested bowls, like in your kitchen cupboard, and how even today the water's falling on the parking lot of the museum. And I could show you a watershed there, the size of this stage. There's going to be a little bit of a bowl-shaped depression, and you're going to see water coming out. And that, of course, is nested in the, the greater um, creek here. Um, this area here, I believe, flowing to Parkinson Mill Creek, and it's going to Chihuahua Creek, and on and on and on, up to the Tallapoosa and out to Mobile. Um, we, in Waterwatch, one time we had a grant. And you've seen these signs probably if you drive the Opelika Road. If you cross Pepperell Branch or you cross Swingle Creek out 188, we put up about 30 signs. And it'll say Pepperell Branch. You know, and then underneath it says flows to the Tallapoosa River. So that was kind of an innovation. We said instead of just identifying the creek, let's, let's see where it goes. And you would think that we... <laughs> the phones started ringing off the wall in the water watch office. And, and one guy, first guy I remember, medical doctor, wow, I lived here all my life. I never knew that this went to the Tallapoosa. Thank you, you know, you, you just educated me today. I love that sign. Hang up, ring, you know, what are you talking about flows to the Tallapoosa? This is my creek and it starts and stops in, <laughs> in Opelika. It stops here, I know it stops here. And so, 
I started thinking, and I devised a theory, um, call it the sausage link theory of stream flow. And then it was reinforced. I volunteered with the Lee County Literacy Coalition. And I had this guy for 10 years, every Monday night, low Chipoka Fire Hall. We were going to try to learn how to read here. He was a great guy. He, he was in prison twice, 15 years total, aggravated assault. First night, he said, what are we going to read? I said, anything you want. You know, it's just you, it's just you and me in this dark fire hall, buddy. You know, we're going to keep everything real calm. But he, he then said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm just working on this watershed plan for Saugahatchee Creek. That's where he lives. He lives on the creek. And he fishes the creek. And the fire hall's in the Saugahatchee watershed. And he said, well, where's that? Where's the Saugahatchee? And so, knowing his background, I couldn't say, well, you dummy, you know. So I said, um, well, it's that creek, you know, like 300 yards by your house where you fish. You know, I thought that was Poker Creek. I thought, OK, you know, we live in Lochapoca. It's the colloquial term. And then I thought, well, let's, let's see where we go with this. I said, what's the name of the creek one bridge down? And he said, oh, that's, that's Drunk Creek. That's where all the college kids go on the weekend. I said, well, what's the name of the creek one bridge up? Oh, that's Stink Creek, where the city of Opelika used to put raw sewage. And that's why I came up with the Sausage Lake Theory. I think, and I, you know, none of it's in the room here, but I think a lot of people, good, smart people, think of streams or don't think of streams as only segments that you see when you cross a bridge. You look upstream, you look downstream, and it, it just disappears, you know? And it's kind of understandable because Alabama's very hilly, very wooded. You rarely, you know, see a huge stretch of a stream. But I think in our minds, maybe a misconception you can help correct, People think of them as these little isolated segments. They're just everywhere, like that guy they called about pepperal branch. It starts and stops in Opelika. And, and so I think we have our work cut out for us on watershed education. And um, just one other point, and I'll move on, but we've all flown and had the window seat where you're just mesmerized by looking out at landscapes, you know? And what hit me once, because I've flown a lot, um, you know, you see all the straight lines, the roads and the fields, the property lines, and, and maybe the crop irrigation circles, but everything is geometrical when it comes to human. And I was doing that on a plane once, just kind of philosophizing, and this phrase came to me, people divide, but water connects, you know? Um, water loves to ignore. I, I get the impression the rivers are almost laughing when they go across your private property keep out sign, you know? Um, and that river is connecting the entire watershed. And so everybody in it, whether they like it or not, is connected. And, and we in Alabama Water Watch, you know, played on, on that idea. You may have seen our bumper sticker. But instead of saying, love thy neighbor, we say, love thy downstream neighbor. And it just helps people to think, you know, that there is someone downstream. When you dump something, when you flush your medication, when you wash your car, you know, when, when you put fertilizer on your lawn, whatever you're doing, somebody somewhere will be affected, you know? And I used to joke, my department had got all over me. The, the poor guy that lives in Mobile, you know, when I do teacher workshops there, I say, you know, we've done studies and every glass of water you drink in Mobile has already been through 17 toilets. You know, and they all kind of, uh, you know. But, you know, one hydrologist has actually said, you know, that's probably a fairly gross underestimate, you know, so we just l we'll leave it at that. But um, we're receiving and we pass on and we don't think about it much, but it's more profound maybe than you would think. So when we were in grade school, we got this water cycle. And it was pretty straightforward. You know, water comes out of the sky, and it flows, and it evaporates, and it just keeps going and going and going. But it actually has, you know, several other components. It gets a little tricky. It gets fairly complicated. We won't go that deep. But the point is there's about, I don't know, maybe eight, eight or nine things water can do today when it's raining out here. It comes out of the sky in some form of precipitation. 
It can get locked into ice fairly quickly, as it has in the past. Um, you know, where I grew up, it was more than a mile of ice, the last glacier time, uh, ice age. Um, New York, western New York is still, they say, coming back a quarter of an inch a year, just rebounding from that massive glacier of 10,000 years ago. So uh, we don't have that to worry about in Alabama. That's why all the Native Americans hightailed it here 10,000 years ago. But a lot of that water evaporates, sometime even before it hits the ground. It can evaporate on the way down, go back into vapor, and then it can transpire. When it hits vegetation, it's taken up into plants, and plants have these little pores, and they can, quote unquote, breathe or sweat, and they release water that, through transpiration. Um, it's why, as an aside, they say on a, on a dry summer day, somebody goes out to water your azaleas to keep them alive, you can actually make it worse by watering for a short time. If you don't really soak them frequently, if you just spritz them, you trick them into opening up all those pores, and then you stop, and they sweat or breathe more water out than you put on. So you're actually drying them out if you don't water properly. That's an extension tip. So you gotta remember transpiration. Infiltration, super important. Uh, it's where water goes down through the soil and will find its way to a channel. And that's where people are often puzzled. Why is this river flowing? It hasn't rained in two weeks and it's still flowing. Well, a lot of that water, in fact, all of that water in a dry, no precipitation time is infiltrated water. And the channel of that stream is by definition below the water table. It has to cut below that groundwater level. That's why there's water coming into it. It's called an effluent stretch of stream where water comes from the ground to the channel. But it's why rivers can flow for, for weeks or even months you know, with very little to no rain because it's like, it's like money in the bank. There's groundwater that's constantly coming in. And of course, runoff, that's a huge deal where water um, is coming down, rain uh, fall events have three characteristics, duration, frequency, and intensity. So how hard it rains, how frequent the storms are, and how long it lasts, all three affect if that uh, rain will sink into the ground or flow over the ground. And of course, we humans have changed that formula a lot. So, the subsurface flow from infiltration is another key part. And then just us, we're all walking around 70% water. Um, so it's incorporated in all living things. If you're a jellyfish, you're up there around 90%, you know? And if you're a tree, you're down a little less than 70%. So, but still, the a majority of our bodies are, are water. So when we look at Alabama's climate and geolo uh, hydrology, uh, we are, this is how we're classified, warm, temperate, or humid subtropic. We're not exactly tropical. As long as there's a freeze, like we had some doozies in the last couple of weeks, we are, we are in a warm, temperate, or subtropic. We're very wet, and the example here of the swimming pool um, is that if, some of you may have built-in pools, if you, if you, had a built-in pool and you, and you just drained it and then put the plug back in and there was no evaporation so all the water that flowed in a year would collect in that pool and you stood in that pool for a year because you had nothing else to do by the end of December where do you think the water would be in the pool on your body your knees your thighs your waist your chest you know <laughs> yeah, if you're short, you'd be gone. <laughs> no, it's, it'd be, you know, most people, it's right about the nostrils. Um, it depends how tall you are, of course. But um, we have about 120 years of rainfall records in Alabama. So these numbers are based on long-term historical records. And on average, we're receiving 58 inches uh, of rain. So some people are underwater, and other people, you know, maybe just the chest. Uh, but the national average, if you look at the entire U.S., it's, it's 30 inches. So 
we're nearly double. We're a very wet state, and we're third among the continental. Only Louisiana and Mississippi get a little more than 58. Uh, Hawaii, okay, Hawaii, 64. You know, another um, higher than we. And Nevada, on an annual basis, 10 inches. So that kind of puts us in perspective across the country, nearly double average, way more than the dry southwestern states, and right on up there in the top, top three uh, of the continental states. Our wettest year was 75 inches in 29, our driest year, 35 inches. So, you know, we're running a, a little less than 60, and there's our, our range, about 35 to 75. That took many years to hit in 120 years. However, um, in, nine, in 2007, we got only 38. We're just three more than our driest. And then two years later, we're just an inch shy of our wettest. So I guess the other point is there's a lot of variability year to year going on now. And, and people are saying it's getting more variable. Uh, in fact, the variation of our rainfall is of greater concern to some climatologists than the decades-long uh, warming process. We, we are going to see more economic impacts, maybe more personal, more ecological impacts from what's becoming more uh, variable uh, patterns of rain. And, and then just to wrap up this slide, maybe open it up to any comments or questions. Um, the wettest 24-hour period we had was right here, July 19, 97. And Hurricane Danny in 24 hours put 32 and a half inches of rain on Dauphin Island. That is just a little shy of the entire year of 1954. So these hurricanes are, are big influencers, especially coastal, but even up our way. And, and it will affect hydrology a lot, and it will affect biota a lot. So just with that, um, any comments or questions? It's a fair amount of information. I didn't know if any of you had anything to share here. But we'll keep moving. Yes? Yeah, okay, the question was, with uh, the water coming through this state and flushing you know, almost 60 inches a year, what about the industrial effluents, or especially the nasty ones, the toxins, heavy metals, you know, the pesticides, and do they accumulate? And of course, the answer is yes, some do. Uh, it depends on the chemical nature. You know, some are much more persistent than others. Um, the Army Corps always has to watch when they dredge for shipping because they resuspend some of those legacy toxins. You know, we used a lot more nasty stuff back in the 60s. You used to treat your house with chlordane. That's for termites, that's now banned. And we used DDT, and we had lead in our paint and lead in our fuel, and there was mercury, and you know, a lot more of these really long-lasting persistent toxins. Uh, they have accumulated, and um, they are in the sediments often, or they are far out in the bay, they can bioaccumulate through life forms. Top predators like tuna or largemouth bass or any of the, of the top of the food chain organisms can bioaccumulate. That's why the health department has a fish advisory they put out every year saying, well, if you're fishing striped bass, you know, top predator, it's recommended pregnant women don't eat this or you only eat, you know, a pound a month or whatever, I'm always a little leery of these, uh, these uh, fish consumption advisories because it's like just a little bit of poison is okay, you know. But, but anyways, um, you know, on that note, um, there's some really interesting studies being done now, core samples. Um, in fact, in the APT uh, show, there was a, a prof down here on campus that's doing core samples for legacy toxins in Lake Jordan and around. They'll punch a core into the sediment, you know, maybe 30, 40 feet, and, 
And actually, leaf fall in a warm, temperate climate, leaf fall is like annuli on a tree. So when you look at the core, you'll see these lines of leaves, and those are year markers. They can actually count years in the mud and say, oh, now we're back in the 60s. Oh, look at DDT just spiked, you know. Oh, now we're in 1940. There's no DDT at all. We haven't even invented it yet, you know. So they're actually able to do a timeline of, of river sediments, which, you know, like in looking at trends and, and so on. So you do have to be careful about resuspension of that material. Better to leave sleeping dog lies in, in some situations because there's some stuff out there. Sure, sure, sure. Well, it's not so much a question on the accuracy of their methods or their, I'm just saying, in terms of them recommending, you know, eating fish that may have a toxin, you know, like even just conceptually, should we eat any toxin? You know, should we, is that just saying, well, our body can process that or that we won't be negatively affected? I mean, all of it's based on, on risk you know, of large populations. You know, that's the way risk assessments are done. It doesn't mean this person won't be very negatively affected or, you know, whatever. It's, it's looking more at a million people. In a million people, in fact, I don't want to belabor this, but I was asked to be on a commission about 15 years ago where Alabama was evaluating 20 carcinogens in water and the current regulations for discharge by industry. So industry is discharging a number of known carcinogens, uh, reproductive disruptors, estrogen mimickers, things like that. And you know, with our industrial effluents, with our pharmaceuticals that we're flushing, that wastewater treatment plants do not process, there's still a lot of active ingredient going downstream. We were asked, and there were medical doctors and chemical company reps, and you know, it was a big panel. It was the most sought panel, they told me. Like, everybody wanted to get on that panel. But for whatever reason, I got on it. They gave us a stack like this, well, read that, and then we'll meet. Bottom line is, we were allowing, according to EPA standards, one cancer per 100,000 people based on those effluent laws. So. When you permit an effluent, you know, there's a cost, right? It's a cost of doing business. You want to make omelets, you got to break eggs, okay? So what we were saying is to have our current economic process in this state, we would allow one new cancer per 100,000 people. So that's about 40 cancers a year, right? We got a little over 4 million people. So somebody is sitting there saying, yeah, I'll sign off on that. 40 cancers a year for you know, billions of dollars worth of economic growth, we'll do that. You know, and that might shock you that people do that, but that, what else can you do? If you go for zero tolerance, we'll just shut everything down, you know? We'll go back to paleo times and line costs and spears and we'll all be fine, live to 40 years old. Um, so there's all these trade-offs on water quality, you know, and I don't want to get into the weeds with this, but most states, over 40 states at that time had raise the standard by an order of magnitude to one new cancer per million. What would that do? That would stiffen the permit on all those dischargers and say, hey, City of Auburn, uh, Russell Mills, you know, Pulp and Paper Company, you have to pre-treat. You cannot put that in this river on those concentrations. You have to scale back, figure out how to do it. It's up to you. We're testing your effluent. You either don't use that compound, or you treat, or you do something, change whatever, so that there's less of that going into the public waters of the state. And it went around and around. There were people vehemently opposed to changing for what it would do to jobs and the economy. And of course, the tree huggers were like, you know, let's make it a million times more strict, you know. And we went back and forth, back and forth, and then everyone agreed, and we raised it by tenfold more strict. So now I look at it, we're, we're allowing one in a million cancers 
on those carcinogens. We omitted some. Some were not on the table. I don't think dioxin was on the table. And dioxin is the most carcinogenic compound that we know about. It largely comes from chlorinating hydrocarbons. That is, when a paper company bleaches paper, uses a lot of chlorine mixed with a lot of pulp, it, it makes dioxin. You know, Of course, they've done a lot of new technology now. We don't bleach as much with the same kind of uh, compounds and on and on. But, but anyways, just based on those 20, uh, you know, you do the math. We were allowing 40 uh, new cancers now, according to our new regs that the Environmental Management Commission uh, signed off on. We allow four. So 36 people in this state, you know, maybe, you know, this is all just odds and probabilities, but 36 people in this state per year are not getting cancer, theoretically, based on those water quality standards. So that's, you know, that's how it works. It's messy business. You know, you're making sausage out there. But that's a uh, long answer to a short question. I hope it, I hope it does it. <laughs> okay, we're, we're uh, right at 11. We're right at break time. Maybe just if there's any more comment before break. Uh, yeah, Emily. Hmm. Good question. I don't have the data. I don't know. Um, but the oyster beds are closed on a different criteria. That's E. coli bacteria or any other pathogen. That's, that's not tied to toxins so much as pathogens. So because a lot of you crazy people like to eat raw oysters, you know. Um, anyways, the health department will periodically check, as they do public beaches, they typically check two weekdays and two weekend days a month during the warm season or the harvest season. And um, they'll, they'll close those oyster beds or close a swimming beach to minimize, obviously, pathogenic risk to humans. Um, and so I don't, know, um, I don't know the trend on if the beaches are closed more or less frequently. Um, than they used to be, let's say, over a 20-year, 50-year time period. Populations are growing. The coast, as you know, is exploding in growth. Sandy soils, a lot of infiltration, a lot of septic systems, a lot of bad septic systems. Uh, Canada geese, uh, livestock, many, many sources of E. coli bacteria, cryptosporidium, other salmonella, other pathogens. Um, it gets tougher to control on the coastal plain because um, there's a lot of infiltration, a lot of nutrients, uh, toxins, and pathogens are quickly uh, infiltrating and entering streams and the bay. So it's, it's a challenge. So we'll take a little break, and we'll see you about 10 after 11. Well, we'll get started here. You know, I know uh, we, we could talk a lot about these last couple of questions, and I, uh, I, I'm not shying away from it intentionally. It's just the, uh, the other material, the people and rivers, the history and the science of it kind of gobbles up all of our time, but I don't want to ever squelch a good question like that. Um, a little bit more on the hydrology. This, this is my backyard. I built a little third-acre pond here. And it has a standpipe here that receives excess water and then a little spillway for when the influx of water is more than what that pipe can handle. And on that pole right there is a rain gauge. 
And I check it every day. I've looked at it for 15 years every day and record the amount. It's a neat little gauge that in the hundredth of an inch takes an inch of water. So you can easily see the scale. If you get more than an inch of rain, as happened in this case, it spills over the lip of this inner cylinder and the outer cylinder can handle 10 inches of rain. So it'd be a rare day that in a 24 hour period we get more than 10. Well, Hurricane Danny gave 32, but that would be exceptional. So this has covered me you know, in Auburn area for years. And the neat thing is you all, if you so desire, could be a part of this Coco Raz. It, it stands for Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, Snow Network. It's a nationwide network of volunteers like yourself that would get one of those gauges. They have to be the same. Uh, you buy them from Coco Raz or our state climatologist, John Christie, has them up in Huntsville. He's our guy in charge of Coco Ross for Alabama. And so you can either be a part, enter your data online, which I do every week or so, I put them all in, and, and or don't monitor, but check the site, because these are all, this is citizen science. This is all volunteers that monitor and enter their data and what's so cool about it, just like bird migrations on eBird, you, you look at all the thousands of data points, and if you plot it over time, you can see a front moving through, you can see a hurricane coming off the Gulf, you can see the wide variety of rainfall in our state, or, or any state. So you can, uh, I'm just bringing it to your attention, Coco Raz is a real neat website sponsored largely by NOAA and others. Um, and you can check Alabama every day and see it. There's about five of us in Lee County. There's maybe, I don't know, a couple hundred in, in Alabama that are doing it on a daily basis, but they always welcome new volunteers. Okay, so here's a little bit of uh, info about our climate. Um, we've, we've looked at the max and mins, but um, interestingly, um, we, we have relatively stable rainfall every month uh, from very different sources of rain types, different storm types, frontal and convectional storms. You may have heard this term. But um, anybody know, uh, well, let's just say, a frontal storm, as you see on the Weather Channel, is more of a wall or a band of, of weather that comes across almost at a continental or at least a regional uh, scale, very large scale weathered patterns. We say, oh, it's raining in, in Louisiana or Texas, and so we will get rain from that storm in two days or whatever. Those are frontal storms. And Alabama has frontal storms that dominate about six months of the year. So which six months do you think we get our frontal storms? approximately fall and yeah fall and winter so from about november it has to do with an oscillation in the atlantic ocean the bermuda high and it 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 goes back and forth and when it comes back to us you know it changes our frontal storms and turns them into convectional storms so obviously they would be dominant for the other six months of the year. And um, as you can imagine, they start in May and they run through into um, mid-fall. And those are the storms where you're sitting in bright sunshine and it's pouring rain across the street. You know, The convectional storms are very local. They kick up where moisture comes off the Gulf and you get those big thunderheads building through the afternoon and then come late afternoon, kaboom, it just comes down, cats and dogs. So the Alabama has its rainfall coincidentally quite stable, but from very different sources through the year. And so we get about three to six inches a month. This is based on 120 years. You know, of course, some less, some more, but that's a long-term average. And we know that many other parts of the country and the world have a very distinct dry season, rainy season. 
I worked in Brazil where it doesn't rain for nine months. I mean, you don't get a drop. And then three months, it's like deluge, you know? So we don't have that weather pattern at all here. We have a fairly consistent um, weather. So what do you think is our wettest month? And again, this would be averaging that six inch or maybe a tad more. What is our wettest month? Okay. Okay. I heard two Marches, a December and a January. It's March, at least now. As you say, it could have changed. So then we have our driest month. Which one? October. Okay, very good. October. Um, I know that from gardening. Um, so, um, about, I've heard different figures. I've heard eight and I've heard 10. Lately, they're, they're moving toward 10% of all the water that flows in the lower 48 comes through Alabama. If it was very evenly distributed, we'd be running 2%, right? About, whoops, sorry, 50 states. Um, you know, that would be if it was completely evenly distributed. And so we're getting, you know, upwards of five times, proportionately five times more than many other places. So again, I'm just trying to drive home how wet we are. Um, one other thing that you can easily access online, it's the U.S. Geological uh, Service uh, site, USGS, and you can pick any creek that they have a gauge on. So I'm just going to talk briefly about this gauge. The gauge is measuring flow or discharge, and the unit is cubic feet per second. So, you know, a cubic feet, one by one by one foot a box of water about that big um, per second. How many of those are going down Saugahatchee Creek? This is the site that I monitor with Water Watch. It's at the 188 bridge that goes from Lochapoca to Waverly. The point being, I get uh, a text message on my phone from the USGS, and you can too, that gives me the discharge of Saugahatchee Creek because I like to float the creek. So. You can, you can say, give it to me every day, whatever it is, or you could say, tell me when it's above this or below this or between this. You can set the parameters if you have a creek of interest that you want to know about. And if we look at Saugahatchee, you know, over, a, let's say, a couple year period, it's mainly running right about here. You know, if you just back up and look where most, especially in this range here and then back here, it's running about, you know, 50 to 100. The thing to keep in mind, this is a log scale, so it goes from 1 to 20,000 very quickly. <laughs> but if you just look at the, you know, the so-called average, we're running right about in here, which is, by the way, a, a pretty nice float for canoeing, gentle float, where you're not walking over rocks and you're not you know, dodging limbs because you're up in the treetops like the kayakers like. So today it's running just under 100. I got my little buzz message today. It's 97 CFS, cubic feet per, seven, per second. So we're, we're running right about here today. The point I'm making, though, is that you remember that Christmas Eve. I was home. That pond I showed you, I was sitting in the backyard, and it was warm. It was like 70, and it was raining, raining, raining. Um, got 11 inches in a couple of days. And my standpipe got covered up, and it wasn't handling it. It hit the spillway, first time in 10 years. And I thought, well, hope the spillway feels good, because I had all my beehives on the dam. Next thing I know, it creeps up over the spillway and starts coming over the whole dam, and starts coming up on my concrete blocks of my beehives, and fortunately did not wash them away, but made it up a full block. It, it was a... The, the city guys say at least a 100-year event. Some are saying closer to two to 300-year event. But Saugahatchee Creek never exceeded 10,000, and we were pushing 20,000. That's Christmas Eve 2015 right there. It, it was through the roof, blew all 120 years of records on discharge. Amazingly, within a year from January to November, this red line had been lowest daily mean flow of record, which was 2007. We dipped below that 
and we're bouncing on, you know, two CFS for many days. We went from historical 120-year high to historical 120-year low in a year. So that's what we mean by variability of flow. Okay, so obviously it rains, and then either through infiltration or runoff, that water is making it to the stream channel, and that's what this graph reflects. And you can access this online for any stream that has a gauge. So just for your information. So what happens? You know, here's a nice, let's say, natural, naturally vegetated forest, you know, pasture or, or meadow or um, natural vegetation, and we bring in a storm. This is done through a study out of the University of Connecticut for this group, NEMO, Nonpoint Source Education for Municipal Officials. It's trying to teach city planners and municipal water guys the impact of development, urbanization on this water cycle. Because what we do to the land surface dramatically changes the water cycle. All the things we talked about, if water goes down, if water goes over, if water goes up, and how it goes, and so on. So when, when they've done studies, this is based on hundreds of different situations, but in general, a healthy watershed should infiltrate about half of that rainfall. You know, water needs to go down. Water needs to go into the soil, serve as a time cap, time release, so that the stream does not get flashy. Uh, streams get flashy if it doesn't infiltrate. That means it rushes off, and the stream quickly rises, and then it stops raining, and the stream crashes. That is not natural, and it's not good for all the critters that are out there fish and bugs and everything else. So this is kind of a baseline. If you're ever you know, thinking about Auburn or your town, you know, the idea is about half of that water should be going down only about 10% over land flow. So we bring in you know, a big city and we say, let's take the exact same rain, same intensity, same duration, same frequency, and what we get is about a reverse. Because we pave that surface with concrete, with asphalt, with steel roofs and shingles, we, we do not give that water a chance to go down. So what's it going to do? It's going to go out across the land. And so now we're talking, in general, in cities, easily half the water rushing into our storm drains, hitting those channels. They're not meant for that. For tens of thousands of years, they've adapted to the hydrology of the natural system. Suddenly, they're getting orders of magnitude more water. So what's the stream going to do? It's not going to be happy. And the first thing it's going to do is start to cut. We call it entrenchment or incision. And many of us know, if you walk the parks or maybe if you live along a street stream, the banks are very vertical and very steep, and that is very unnatural. Because a stream is meant to breathe, it's meant to get up onto a floodplain. Think of that as a pressure release. And rivers of the world depend on that, fish of the world depend on that pulse and that wide floodplain that just takes all that energy and dissipates it so that soil stays in place, fish stay in place, mussels stay in place, and then the water gradually recedes. What happens when that stream gets entrenched and it's down there, hello, you're supposed to be up here, you're down there, it gets really angry and it starts banging around inside that confined channel. We call it being divorced from its floodplain. It can't get there anymore. And the only thing it can do is erode all that bank and make a new floodplain down there and it won't stop till it's done. And hundreds of thousands of tons of sediment are washing to Mobile Bay because of the way land has been treated. I mean, even early agriculture, the legacy of cotton, which in the old days was highly erosive, the way we grew cotton, it's wide open, it's a plant that doesn't have much land cover. There was a lot of erosion, and we're living on the legacy of some of that early agricultural practices. Now we've ramped it up orders of magnitude through 
rapid growth of cities, urbanization. And it's why Auburn, when you go to a town meeting, planning commission, whatever, what are we talking about now? By federal law, by state law, and just by city ordinance, it's stormwater management. We've got to, got to, got to deal better with stormwater. And so now all the green spaces and getting away from curb and gutter, going into what they call low impact development, and gentle swales in your development instead of storm drains, forcing water off into the, you know, the stream, um, bioretention ponds like you see at the theater or Walmart. Everybody's building these big ponds, you know, and there's just tons of books written about it. I sum it up in two words, you know. If we all just said, whether it's your yard, your city, whatever, promote infiltration. Just do whatever you can do to get that water to go down. So rain gardens and just more green space, more natural vegetation, help the rain get into the soil. Don't force it out. And when you think about the big, big box parking lots, not only are you forcing the water to rush into that stream, but think about that blacktop in the 100 degree August day. That water is maybe 20, 30 degrees warmer than it should be. You've put it on a hot plate and then you rush it off into that stream. Just think about those poor critters out there. We give them so much stuff to deal with, you know? So we have to be a lot more cognizant of that. So let's look at, get it down to home a little bit more. This is a topo map. This is the Mobile Bay, you know, and it's two thirds of Alabama. Again, the Tennessee Valley and the Coastal Plain, Chattahoochee are not a part of that. But this, you know, from the uplands, Georgia now and the Smokies and the edge of the Appalachians, the Valley and Ridge here, uh, the Piedmont and so on. You can see the fall line uh, just by color of elevation. This is more the upland, that hard rock. And this is the beginning of the Coastal Plain right here. And so that's just a view to remind you that virtually all of our rivers are in more than one physiographic province and most crash across this fall line here. So here's another picture of the Mobile Bay. We have a little piece of it up in Tennessee, a good chunk in Georgia, Tom Bigby over here in Mississippi. So we have our neighbors, you know, involved with the whole deal. And that's about 44,000 square miles in four states. It's covering about, you know, 52,000 square miles when we throw in our neighbors of, of, and two thirds of our state that it drains. And amazingly, here's the thing, we've been talking about how much rain we get. It's less than 2% of the area of the United States. It's fairly small, but by flow, it's number four. Only Mississippi, the Mississippi River, come on, it starts in Canada, you know, covers most of the US. The Ohio and the Columbia basins have more flow, more cubic feet per second flow uh, than we do. And, and that's not all. This is the amazing. If you go on an aerial basis per square mile, we're number one. And you say, well, wait a minute. You're saying we have more flow than the Mississippi? More flow per square mile. And we get coming out here on an average daily basis about 43 billion gallons of day of water coming out of here. 43 billion gallons a day, that's a lot of water. So if we put it in perspective, here's the Mobile Basin right here. The brown is the Mississippi, gigantic, you know, southern Canada and way out west, Idaho and Montana and, you know, up here into the Ohio Valley, Pennsylvania, and Virginia and so on. Um, this, by the way, the yellow and brown is the Gulf of Mexico drainage. So you can see a huge chunk of North America and Mexico, some include Mexico and North America, uh, drains here, neither of our large oceans, but right here. You know, is it any wonder this Gulf is, is vulnerable? But um, Mississippi Basin, 28 times larger, the brown, 28 times larger than our little old mobile but has one third the flow by area. Why? Because of all this, it's so dry out here. It's very dry. So this might average 30 inches of rain, if they're lucky. I bet it's closer to 25. 
and we're averaging 58. So that's why, on an aerial basis, we get a lot more water. Even the Columbia, you think of the Northwest as being in a very wet area, but Eastern Washington is high desert. So they're six times bigger than we are, but just a little over half the flow by area. So the Mobile punches way above its weight class. It's small, but boom, on an aerial basis, a lot more water. So how do we think of streams? We'll move through this a little quick, but we have three kinds of streams, even before we get to number one. Ephemeral streams are defined as just little channels that are mainly dry. They flow less than 30 days a year. So they're very ephemeral. You may have them on your property. You know, you get a good rain, oh yeah, there's water, but tomorrow it's not. Or it might flow for a week in a real heavy rainy period, but um, those are the ephemerals. The intermittents are, you know, a little more than the ephemerals, but less than perennials. And the perennials, of course, are continuous flow. So the first perennial we call a first order stream. You see on a topo map sometimes there's little dash lines and maybe even dotted lines that go way up here for this stream. Those are the intermittent and the ephemerals that feed into that first order stream. And then they meet to form a second, and the two seconds meet to form a third, two thirds to form a fourth, and we just keep going. Hydrologists like to compare apples to apples, so they use stream order to kind of think about the, the type of stream that they are working in. So uh, this is a little section of the Black Warrior Basin, and it shows it in two different scales. It's the same area, same stretch of stream. So for years, this is what the Geological Survey of Alabama and others used. It's the one to 100,000 scale, and it's why in all the textbooks up until just about two years ago, we said we had 77,000 miles of perennial streams, or sorry, not perennial, about 60% of those are perennial, about 40 are intermittent, but we always said we had 77,000 miles. Then through uh, different techniques, um, different ways of looking at streams, whatever some decisions made, we now use this map. You can see if you go to a finer scale, obviously you're gonna get a lot more of the feeder streams of these. And so today, this is the number that we use, 132,400 miles of streams, just in our little old state, you know. That's why we said, you know, five times around the earth if they were all shoestrings tied end to end. So again, we're a very stream, river-oriented state, virtually no natural lakes, and um, that's just the way uh, Alabama is. So um, hydrologic unit codes, it's another way that people, we won't get too technical with this, but just like zip codes, you know, zip codes go from one on up across the country, east to west. Anybody from the west coast, what's your zip code out there? What did it start? Do you remember? Nine, yeah. So California was nine. Uh, anybody, Midwest, Kansas, Illinois? There are fours and fives and sixes, yeah. So it's the same principle. Uh, zip code, this is just a stream zip code if you want to look at it that way. So we start, New England is one, and it goes over to 18, you know, and the continental US. So this whole southeast, all the way on up, Virginia way and you know, all of Alabama into Mississippi, we're in the 03 zip code. That's any, any stream in there is going to start 03. That's just our address. So if you're a hydrologist and you see a hydrologic unit code, if it starts 03, you're just like a good mailman. Oh, I know that southeast. You can just, you can go to the bank on that. So I'm just giving you an example of the Escatapa River. It's right on the Alabama-Mississippi line. In fact, it flows into the Pascagoula River and Pascagoula Bay, but it's a big, well, a moderately sized chunk of uh, just west of Mobile. In fact, this reservoir right here is called Big Creek Lake, and it's the major drinking water supply for the city of Mobile. So even though the Escatapa ends up in Mississippi, it's vitally important for 
mobile. So let's just look at the escatopa. You see it's like a side of beef. We got it all carved up. And the six-digit hux, hydrologic unit codes, we generally call basins. These are all watersheds, but remember we got different names. So the Pascagoula River, that would be the Escatapa and the Pascagoula, because they meet right here. The entire Pascagoula is going to be a Huck 6. But now we come to the Escatapa, and if you go on the USGS site, it's an eight digit Huck. And this is its Huck. Eight digits, see, two, four, six, eight. Starts 03 because that's this whole region. But now we have more detail. This Huck 8, this Huck 8, that number would be this outline right here, this watershed. And it's called the Escatapa River. So it's divided into these larger, darker brown lines. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I believe there's seven. And those are Huck 10s. They get called watersheds. So basin, subbasin, watershed. So Upper Big Creek is this guy right here, the blue. It's one of the Huck 10s. The others are in brown. And that's, you can see all this number is contained there, and then you add two more digits. So the smaller the unit, the smaller the watershed, the longer the number. Because in that number is embedded the code all the way on up, you know. And then finally, we get to a Huck 12, and that's Juniper Creek, which is this one right here. It's, it's a little trib of Big Creek, which is a trib of the Escatapa, which is a trib of the Pascagoula. So that's that nested bowl, the way it looks on the ground. OK, so we can at least, no, we can't. We're right at 1140. <laughs> at least it's a unit. But we're going to have to get the biodiversity in uh, starting next week. Um, I'm by training uh, aquatic ecologist, biologist type, so this is throwing briar wrapper in the briar patch. Um, I love talking about critters. And maybe I'll bring it next week too, but um, if you have time and want to browse it before we leave, a lot of this is based on Scott Duncan's book, uh, Southern Wonder. I'll bring the book next week too. It's a wonderful relatively new book about biodiversity in Alabama. It covers both aquatic and terrestrial. But um, just as a heads up, and many of you know this, it's, it's world class biodiversity. I mean, number one in so many categories of organisms, starting with fish that we'll do next week. So see you then. <laughs>